Check, check. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Our event will be starting in a few minutes. Please find your seats. Once again, our event will be starting in a few minutes. Please silence your cell phones and find your seats. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats. Our event will be starting in a few minutes. Please kindly silence your cell phones and find your seats. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, our program is about to begin. Please find your seats. Our program will begin immediately. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Mark Anthony Neal, the James B. Duke Professor of African and African American Studies. I am also the chair of the Department of African and African American Studies, and I'd like to thank you all for being here this afternoon. On February 8, 1968, three 18-year-old students from South Carolina State University and HBCU in Orangeburg, South Carolina, were killed by state highway patrolmen who opened fire on a crowd of unarmed college students. Two years later, a similar shooting death occurred at Jackson State University, another HBCU in Mississippi, and most famously at Kent State University, where four white students were killed by National Guards. The violence was reflective of the torment of the era where students across the nation not only made demands for change in the nation, but at the very institutions that were charged with preparing them for the future, a future that many of these institutions were unprepared for, the futures that their students demanded. Duke was such an institution. Like every protest, the Allen Building takeover was not unique. There were student strikes at San Francisco State University an armed student takeover at Cornell University that occurred only two months after the Allen Building takeover. Mirroring the outbreak of sit-ins that went viral in the spring of 1960 after four black students from North Carolina A&T, another HBCU, famously began a movement by sitting down at a segregated lunch counter at a Greensboro Woolworth department store. The Allen Building takeover was singular, though, because of what it meant for the future of Duke and the city of Durham. With the integrating of Duke in 1963, Mary Mitchell Harris, Jean Kendall, Wilhelmina Reuben Cook, Cassandra Smith Rush, Nathaniel B. White Jr., forever known as the First Five, and campuses across the nation, the political passions of activism that were gestating at historically black colleges and universities began to flower. That flowering at Duke took shape in the spring of 1968, immediately after the shooting death of Martin Luther King Jr. with the silent vigil remembered as the largest student protest in the history of the university. Among those student demands were increased wages and the right to collective bargaining among Duke's non-academic workers, many of whom were black dorm knights who never had the opportunity to in attend an institution like Duke. That flowering was full bloom on February 13, 1969, when dozens of black students occupied the Allen Building, supported outside by white allies who could bear witness to their demands for a public unprepared for the rage that had been bubbling within a generation that was no longer going to be denied access to their futures. The first of those demands by those students who occupied the Allen Building was for the formation of a fully accredited Department of Afro-American Studies. I speak with you today as a James B. Duke professor and chair of the nationally and internationally renowned Department of African and African-American Studies. <laughs> in large part because of the vision and bravery of those students 50 years ago. It speaks volumes that the Allen Building takeover has resonated for virtually every generation of student activists at Duke for the last five decades. That a full 50 years later, it is a beacon of possibility for a generation of Asian and Asian American students making their claim on not just diversity at Duke, but real inclusion. Duke is not what it once was, but it certainly is not where it needs to be. We can thank those brave souls of 50 years ago for always making clear, making that clear to us. I have the honor now to introduce a woman who I simply refer to as my dean, <laughs> but that would be Valerie Ashby, who became the Dean of Trinity College of Arts and Sciences Dean at Duke University in July of 2005. She received her Bachelor of Arts and her PhD in chemistry from that other institution down the road. <laughs> we don't begrudge her. <laughs> we don't begrudge her that fact. 
And not only was she a nationally known chemist, she was the first black woman to chair the chemistry department at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I've been privileged to work with her for the last four years. Um, those of you who have heard the wonderful news that she has been retained for another five years. <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping that we can keep her. <laughs> um, I present to you now, Dean Valerie Ashby. Wow, uh, what a privilege, what a privilege to be here. Uh, so first let me thank uh, Professor Mark Anthony Neal for his leadership in organizing this commemoration of the Allen Building takeover 50 years later. As you just heard and as you live, the takeover in Allen Building began on the morning of February 13th, 1969, with an estimated number of 60 to 75 black students at Duke barricading themselves in the registrar's office on the first floor of Allen Building. What a pivotal moment that was in Duke's history. The impact over the years is clear and significant. The priorities that the students brought forward have really changed this university. As Mark just said, the first demand was the establishment of a fully accredited Department of uh, African and African American Studies. And actually, I believe it was just Afro-American Studies at the time. The second was the enrollment of more black students, revised criteria for admission, financial reassurance for those students, and a black advisor. I feel like I might be that black advisor. <laughs> And at the end, an, another one of those uh, demands was the end of tokenism of black representation in the administrative structure. Your sacrifice <laughs> has changed Duke. Duke is not the same. Duke now has, as Mark just said, and I'm so proud, one of the top AAAS programs in the country, chaired by Professor Mark Anthony Neal, who was promoted to distinguished professor, as he said last year, and he is the James B. Duke Professor of African and African American Studies. That's worth another round of applause. <laughs> Duke has the most diverse student body in its history, uh, and that includes a significant African and African American population. Duke has the most diverse senior leadership team in the country. I'll just sit still on that one for a second. And I believe that you heard from President Price earlier this morning, and Provost Kornbluth is here. They have been responsible, along with Dick Broadhead prior to that, in hiring that very diverse administrative team. Let me tell you who it includes. It includes Dr. Jean Washington, who is chancellor of the entire health system. <laughs> it includes Professor Paula McLean, an outstanding political scientist, uh, nationally known, leading the National Organization of Political Science presently, but she's also the dean of the graduate school here at Duke. It includes Professor Gary Bennett, uh, an extraordinary psychology and neuroscientist who is now vice provost for undergraduate education. It includes Professor Arlie Petters, who is a world-renowned mathematical physicist, but he also runs all of academic affairs for Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. And it includes Dr. Luke Powery, who I believe is also in the audience, who is Dean of the Chapel, all of whom are black, and I did not call everybody's name, but what I want to just relay to you so if you can feel proud about this Duke University and what you have done is that the leader of the health system, the leader of the graduate education, the leader of undergraduate education, the leader of the chapel, are, uh, and the leader of academic affairs are all black. <laughs> I didn't need to look up anybody else's data to tell you that we were the most diverse in the country among our peers, which is critical for you to understand. Um, and so it is also not lost on me, and I say this personally to those of you who really made the sacrifice that my existence on this campus today as Dean of Trinity College of Arts and Sciences is directly tied to your courage and to your convictions in 1969. So something happens differently for me when I walk into Allen Building. 
when I walk in the Allen building, the first thing I see every morning is the picture of the portrait now of Julian Abel that now is sitting <laughs> proudly displayed upon entry. Really, um, it took us a moment to get there, <laughs> but there he is. Um, and then I go into my office, which is 104 Allen Building, which is right outside of where you did your work. Um, and I am not confused, and I am not confused about how I am able to walk into that office every day. Um, I owe you a huge debt of gratitude. You began a movement in 1969, the benefits of which my colleagues and I are reaping today. Our job is to make you proud. So let me be clear, we continue to face old and new challenges, but I want to assure you that we are committed to the sacrifice required for true change, for culture change. We are committed to the intentional, consistent attention required to create true community on this campus. We are committed to the discomfort of self-examination and self-reflection that continues to push us beyond checking the diversity box by the numbers that we have to true culture change. A change that equates excellence with diversity without question and allows this university ful to fulfill its true mission. And yet with all of our efforts, I am really clear that our sacrifice pales in comparison to those of the students, the young people, not administrators, not paid employees in 1969 who put their professional careers and their personal safety on the line. May I ask those who were a part of the Allen Building takeover in 1969 who are present here today to please stand. I don't quite know how to say thank you enough for what you did 50 years ago, but I am grateful for what you have done, and our job is to help, is to continue to help this university move forward so that nothing that you did would have been in, done in vain. Thank you so much for allowing us the privilege of honoring here, you here this weekend. Thank you so much. Ashby. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Ksanit Tekia and I am a member of the class of 2019, which means I now have just a couple of more months before I join the group of amazing individuals here today as Duke alumni. It truly, it truly is a blessing that we're able to gather here today in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Allen Building takeover. And I have the honor and privilege being part of the introduction of the panel of some of the most courageous and impactful students to walk the greens of Duke University. Nearly 50 years ago, on February 13, 1969, Chuck Hopkins, Michael LeBlanc, Michael McBride, Bertie Howard, Charles Beckton, Catherine LeBlanc, and many other protesters we've seen here today decided that simply getting the opportunity to attend Duke University was simply not enough. Although in 1963, Duke decided to admit black students to its institution for the first time in history, it did not come with a full set of rights and a guarantee that the university would do everything it could to make Duke a home for its black student. It wasn't until November 1967 when a group of African American students organized an Allen Building study in to protest the use of segregated facilities by Duke student groups that the university finally agreed on a complete ban of the use of such facilities. The, the demands presented by the Allen Building protesters presented a challenge to Duke University to face the task of genuinely making it a home for its black students. Thankfully, later that year, student protests resulted in the creation of the Black Studies Department, a commitment to recruit more African-American students and faculty. 
the original protesters that are here today set a precedent that has guided student activism in the years since the Allen Building takeover. Since the takeover, many protests and demonstrations have been organized surrounding unmet demands and a push towards continuing the fight that students started 50 years ago. Thankfully, we have here with us today six of the original protesters who will have the opportunity to tell their stories and share with us their thoughts surrounding the events that unfolded on February 13th, 1969. It is now my honor to introduce our moderator, one of the original protester, protesters and someone who was a part of the group of individuals who have made it possible for me to be here today, Catherine LeBlanc. Thank you very much, Q. Uh, that was an in excellent introduction. Uh, Q's parents immigrated from Eritrea many years ago, and I am just so proud of him. He wants to be a medical doctor, and I know you're going to be an excellent one. I can't tell you what it means for us to be here today. As Dean Ashby was speaking, tears came into my eyes, because I, didn't, I don't think I ever thought this day would come. Uh, that certainly was not the way we were treated um, the day of the takeover, but it's very gratifying to know that over time, the institution has realized that we really did make a positive contribution to the university. And of course, to see people like Dean Ashby and uh, Chairman um, Mark Anthony Neal just bring such joy to our hearts. I would like to thank them and the leadership of this university uh, for welcoming us back. I really uh, want to thank President Price because it, and, and Provost Cornbluff, it takes courage on their part to be willing to acknowledge that folk that they called rowdy protesters 50 years ago are worthy to be acknowledged for something that we thought was right. So today we're going to have a lively conversation. It has just been fabulous <laughs> for us to talk amongst each other, reacquaint with each other, and prompt each other's memories uh, because we are all over 50. <laughs> and <laughs> some of our memories have had to be prompted. Uh, but before doing that, I would also like to um, acknowledge two people who are not with us here today. Uh, Bertie Howard was supposed to be on this panel, uh, and last night uh, she took ill and um, is not able to be here, but we are very happy that we have uh, Janice Williams to take her place. Uh, we're sending lots of prayers out to Bertie, and we feel that she's going to be fine in a day or two. I also would like to acknowledge a woman who has been a part of this planning from the very beginning. That is Dr. Brenda Armstrong. <laughs> Brenda's two sons are here, Bradley and Ben Armstrong. I'm going to ask you to please stand. <laughs> Brenda is the person that I talked to, to about having a reunion over five years ago. And we continued that conversation until early last year when we actually put together a small committee and began real discussions. And we were so fortunate to be able to get Professor Neal as a partner. He was definitely for the go, and we have worked so well together. We have to thank Professor Neal, Camille Jackson, Tyra Dixon, would you three please stand because you did yeoman's, <laughs> yeoman's work beyond the call of duty. And we are so appreciative. That's Tara back there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, I'm going to now ask that my panel join me on the stage as we begin our conversation today.
but yeah. That is our daughter out there that's making all that noise. <laughs> um, I would like to start by helping to set the context so that you will see who these people were when we got here. On the printed program, you will see some of the things that they have been able to accomplish since they left Duke. And we're not gonna necessarily focus on that. We wanna talk a little bit about who we were when we came as 17 and 18 year olds. And then of course, when we went into the building, we were 18, 19, and 20 year olds. So I will begin. Uh, I was coming from a small southern uh, town here in North Carolina. I was valedictorian of my class. I had been designated a National Achievement Scholar by the National Merit Corporation. Uh, I came from a working class family. My father was career military. And I had already been on picket lines protesting what was going on in the South at that time in terms of legal segregation and just the marginalization of black people. So Chuck, Chuck Hopkins, who was our fearless leader and took yeah. us into Ellen Building. <laughs> Tell us a little bit, Chuck, about <coughs> who you were when you arrived at Duke as an 18-year-old. Uh, Mike. Mike. The mic. The mic. Um, hey, you're good. It's a long yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, like Chad I was from a family in Richmond, Virginia. Talk down. Talk down. Okay. That's hard for him to talk <laughs> down. <laughs> uh, I was from a working class family in Richmond, Virginia, segregated black community. President in my class. That I was a recipient of the National Achievement Scholarship. This was a period in history when schools like Duke were Duke uh, were, were reaching out to uh, bring black students onto their campuses. Um, as far as my family, uh, my father was uh, 38 years uh, freight handler for the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. My mother was a uh, food preparer in an uh, all-night restaurant. Uh, eight of us in the family. Uh, I was the first to go to college. Um, strong values were instilled, mainly the sense of what was right and what was wrong. Uh, and uh, I think that's, that's, that's what I brought with me to Duke uh, that impacted my, uh, my behavior. Thanks, Chuck. Mike. I know you came up from New Orleans, Louisiana. We could hardly understand your language. <laughs> 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 All right, but go ahead and share with us who was Mike LeBlanc when he arrived on Duke's campus. All right, ju just one second before I say who I was. Uh, I need to piggyback on Kat. Um, Dr. Brenda Armstrong was real special to me as she's um, a kid's uh, godmother. But beyond that, um, I believe that in terms of accomplishment, Duke, graduates the most diverse class in the medical profession, I think, other than Meharry. So I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. <clears throat> so as Catherine said, I came from who that nation? <laughs> and we just got robbed, but I'm sure y'all know, I'm sure know that already, right? Um, but, but having said that, uh, my high school was an uh, all-black male high school of 750 students. And unlike these two, I was a National Achievement finalist. But my other colleague that they couldn't understand was Von Glapion right there, and he was a National Achievement Scholar. Uh, our class had 23, we were an advanced accelerated program. Our class had 23 uh, black males, and of those 23, 13 of us were a National Achievement finalist. Um, <laughs> And, and beyond that, we were uh, civil rights protesters. Uh, I have a, what's now a tiny little scar here, but as a 135, 40 pound, 13 uh, year old, I got beat by the police for sitting down at Woolworths. When uh, back in the sit in, I, th I think that was 63 or 64. So uh, we came to the university, uh, a lot of us with uh, a civil rights knowledge and a civil rights awareness. 
Thank you, and that uh, Catholic high school that Michael attended in New Orleans was one of the best academic high schools in the country, St. Augustine. Oh, one other thing right now before y'all clap for that. We have, St. <laughs> Augustine, we were good in sports and we were good in the arts. We actually, it's just announced, we have four folks that are nominated for Grammys tomorrow. All right, <coughs> and you were gonna say something about the uh, Vietnam War protester who was one of your teachers? Oh, I forgot about that. Those of you that are old enough to remember, as I look over at Mark Pinsky, uh, the Vietnam War, um, our high school homeroom teacher in eighth and ninth grade was a Philip Berrigan. <laughs> and Philip Berrigan was a, a seminal um, chief figure in the United States protest against uh, the Vietnam War. So yeah. that was our background. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mike. Janice, Janice most graciously agreed to join our panel uh, this morning uh, when Bertie was not able to come. And so Bert, uh, Janice, if you would just say a few words about who Janice was when she came to Duke from, I think, Huntsville, Alabama? That's right. Um, I came at, I was a freshman in 1969. So you can imagine, my eyes were wide open. I was like a deer in headlights. But I was determined to follow them because I, too, grew up in a family where uh, we were taught the discrimination, the hardships that blacks had suffered. My grandmother told the story to us as growing up that her grandmother had actually been a slave, and because she would not cry when she was whipped, the slave master cut her thumb off. So what she did was she slung her thumb and the blood and walked off and still did not cry. And so it was, uh, you know, you don't talk back or ask any questions because this, the, what the moral you got was, okay, you're going to be big, you're going to be strong, and you're not going to cry. So I came here with that kind of uh, mentality and had no idea what I was walking into. Um, I was, I graduated from public high school, uh, Robert E. Lee. I was the first one, uh, yes, Robert E. Lee Robert High School. E. <laughs> yes, our fight song was Dixie. Yes, it was. And I was in the band, so I had to play it every time. <laughs> so, uh, I was one of 10 black students who entered that school in 1965 after Kennedy made George Wallace let us in. So uh, the, the high school was 2,000 students. I didn't see another black until lunchtime. Uh, it was unusual now when I look back on it because not one other person other than those 10 students in that school were black. No janitors, no cooks, no uh, administrators. So I was really happy, not to mention those teachers, I was really happy to get to Duke at first and find out that I was surrounded by black people in the blue uniform. Then I began to realize how they were treated different. Uh, and so I was anxious to know what could I do to make this different. I remember telling the maid in my dorm that my mama would kill me if she knew she came in my room and cleaned up after me. So I asked her to please not do that. I wanted to call the front desk person by her last name, but her, her name was B. That's how she was introduced. But the dorm mother, who was only a few years older than me, we had to call Miss Stafford. And so I began to quickly learn what those disparities were and the injustices were and was eager to learn how to uh, fight against that. And as Mike said, uh, one of the what well, one of the first great persons I met was Cat LeBlanc and Bertie, and I just don't feel worthy to be sitting here in her place. But I will do my best to share my story. But uh, as a black freshman on campus, Bertie and Cat LeBlanc came to my room, and I'll share that another time as to how they were looking and what they did. And I'm my eyes really got big then. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it, I really was so thankful, <coughs> and that was the moment that I said, okay, I'm going to be all right. Um, 
but uh, Brenda was a little spitfire of a person, Brenda Armstrong. And I just couldn't believe the command that she had of, as my daddy would call it, the Kang's English. Uh, and uh, that I was just so impressed with her and would uh, try to learn as much as I could from her. Thank you very I, much. I was going to say I was going and going. Okay, thank you very much, Janice. <laughs> and the only reference she's making to what, uh, how, what Bertie and I look like is that we've been sporting our pros since 1969. <laughs> so those of you who just got started, we got started back then and we never went back. Um, they had on dashikis, but a lot of people don't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to, thank you very much, Janice. Let's go to Mike McBride, who came up to Duke from LaGrange, Georgia. Uh, Mike was president of the Afro-American uh, Society when we went into Allen Building. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I attended a, a segregated high school in LaGrange, I uh, had only about 65 people in my graduating class. I was salutatorian. I was a, a national achievement finalist. My parents were both uh, college graduates. My mother was an English teacher. My father was a uh, county agent at the time. Those of you who were in the 4-H club, you know what that, you know what that is. Uh, except that uh, at that time, uh, the extension service was segregated, so there was uh, an agent for uh, Negro farmers and an agent uh, for white farmers. Um, I resented that. I resented uh, much that I saw growing up. I resented that my father had to flee Alabama uh, when my mother was pregnant with me because he wouldn't say yes ma'am to a white woman who handed him this check. I came to Duke with that uh, resentment and a, a determination to change things as best I could. Thank you very much, Mike. And Charles Beckton. <laughs> Charles, uh, we call him Beck. <coughs> Beck was the only black person in his class when he came to uh, Duke Law School. Uh, he was the only graduate student that went into Allen Building with us, the elder statesman. And as, yeah. uh, <laughs> as you will find out a little bit later in our narrative, you will also see that he saved our lives. <laughs> but uh, Beck, tell us who you were Don't when you got to do. Thank you and good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, now that Ted has taken my three main lines, let me tell you that I grew up in rural eastern North Carolina. Mike described his school as segregated. Mine was very, very, very segregated. Uh, I grew up both in Moorhead City and Aden. I claim both as hometowns. But I went to school in Aden. And there was, at all times while I was growing up there, a billboard welcoming you to Aden. KKK welcoming you to Aden. Uh, that's the environment I grew up in. Uh, I and several of my friends after our freshman year in college came back in 1963 and walked in the theater and instead of going upstairs where the blacks would sit, marched straight into the downstairs and sat on the front row where all the whites were. And after about 10 seconds, we said, wait a minute, maybe we all sit on the back row. We got up and went and sat on the back row so everybody would be behind us. That's my background. Uh, I did not know my father. I was raised by three wonderful women, my mother, my grandmother, and my aunt, uh, an educator. I got started into education early, fell in love with law early, and uh, have done that all of my life. Thank you very much, Beck. <laughs> so this uh, gives you some sense for who we all were when we got to Duke. Let's shift now to talk about a little bit about what life was like for those early um, black students on campus. And I'm going to call upon Becton, LeBlanc, McBride, and Chuck. And then we're going to bring uh, CB, uh, who was the first African-American to play Duke basketball. He 
Mike's going to come forward and share a little bit about what it was like for him as the uh, first black uh, player on the basketball team. So let us uh, start with you, uh, Becton. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the indignities that you experienced even before you got to Duke Law School. As Kat mentioned, I was the only black in my class of 115 in the law school. There were two other blacks in the second year class, none in the third year class. Uh, my next year, one of the blacks in, this, in that second year class was no longer there. There were no blacks in the class after me, so there were only two blacks in the law school. My third year, uh, three blacks came in, so there was a total of four blacks in the law school. Uh, but I think the thing Kat was asking about beforehand actually happened after my first year in law school. My first year in law school, my roommate, Lee Hatcher, James Lee Hatcher, found a room, 624 Price Avenue, on the, quote, other side of town, three blocks from Central. We called it a Seymour house because you could see more holes in it than anything else. Uh, and when the hawk came down the chimney, the oil heater in the room would go out. And so our second year, we decided to look for a house on this side of town, the Duke side of town. Uh, Patrick came down looking for a house, and no realtor would show him a house on this side of town. The very next weekend, I came back from D.C., and Hatcher and I tried to find a house on this side of town, could not. We went by the Duke Housing Office on campus, and they said there's just nothing available. Uh, about a week before law school was to start for my second year, we came back down to the housing office and said, we need a house close to campus. They said, nothing available. That we aren't going to move. We're going to sit right here till you find us a house. I'm happy to report that in 15 minutes, the shortest sit-in in the history of the world. <laughs> Wait a minute. Not only did they find us a house, it was at 1204 West Markham, right behind Baldwin Auditorium. It had a balcony and two rooftop decks. All right. Yeah. And I understand that the former provost now lives in that house. Okay, thanks, Beck. Um, Mike LeBlanc, um, would you let, share a couple of the indignities that you experienced? Uh, I'll share indignities, but then there's also some just funny personal stuff. Um, but um, uh, Dean, you talked about the, uh, I guess we have an African American that's uh, head of political science. Uh, one of my first classes in his freshman year, I will not use the professor's name, but he wrote a book in uh, so I was taking a political science course. Um, I'm from New Orleans, as she said. New Orleans at the time, Obama, were we 40, 50 percent black? At least 40, 50 percent black. At Duke, I could go two to three days without seeing another black person. That was so totally disconcerting to me. Um, and so, again, the, and, and so for us, for that first semester, you were always the one in the class. And so I had to, um, I was taking a uh, political science course with Sue K. Simpson. I said I wouldn't say his name, so. Um, and, and he wrote the book that we were using. And he would talk and he'd say, the Negro over there, um, what, what do you think? Because, yeah, what do you think? What, what did he say? The Nigra. And so for first two or three classes, I took it. You know, but I'm 17 years old. And I'm like, I'm, no, this ain't right. I know this is not right. And so next time I got sweat pouring down. Like, I'm not taking this. And I said, excuse me, uh, Professor Simpson, um, this is really going to get you out. I'm a Negro. <laughs> He graduated. That's right. That's right. 1967, y'all might not think about it. We were Negroes. Negroes. We're yeah. James Brown hadn't made that record yet. <laughs> All right. And, and so you had graduated from being colored. That, right. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, it, and, and what Beckton said was real clear because we had just moved from being colored to, I was proud, I am a Negro. And he said, Negro, sit down. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, no, uh, I'm a Negro, and we just, you know, anyway, we had a battle every time for the whole semester. Every time he said nigra, I stood up and I said negro. 
But y'all think about it, to be 17 years old, that, that was not easy back then. Uh, hold up. But, but other things that weren't an indignity, this, uh, no, no, I don't want to offend anybody, but I remember being in Page Auditorium. Um, and for some reason, we got the Page Auditorium early. And then they opened the doors to Page and all of the students came in. I had an anxiety attack. And the reason I had an anxiety attack is, don't get mad, I just saw pink. I just, the, 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 the Caucasian students just rushed in. I couldn't make out a face. I couldn't make out blonde hair. I couldn't make black hair. I just saw this pink wave coming at me. And I, I totally freaked out. Um, one last thing. I'm afraid, Mike, we've got to move on. Okay. And we know you got some goodies. All right. Um, Michael, uh, le well, let me go to Chuck. Uh, Chuck, you came here really smart, knew how to write. Share that experience with the audience. Yeah, I was going to share another one. but Share both of those. <laughs> Michael yeah. shared, too. Well, the first experience I wanted to share was just, uh, it was a, not necessarily not necessarily an indignity, but it was, it was an image coming here as a freshman in the fall. And, and as Mike just said, uh, you, you didn't see a lot of black people. I don't know, for some reason, Duke thought that the best way to, uh, to bring us here was to keep us isolated, keep the black students isolated from each other. So in all of our classes, we were the only one. And, and, uh, and, so, and, and on top of that, that's a small number. So, you know, I would see across campus, uh, you know, another black student, you know, individual, and, uh, but there was never any kind of interaction. Um, interaction. There was, uh, and, and to this day, I don't know why that was their policy. But, uh, but then, uh, you know, we got here in September, and then, you know, the fall developed, and you know what happens in the fall? Leaves. And Duke's got all these trees. So you got leaves covered in the ground. And I wake up one morning, and there's all of these black people just are raking leaves. And I was like, wow, you know, our presence <laughs> is here. We are here. And for me, uh, it was like a scene out of Gone with the Wind, uh, you know, to, to, to just see that and absorb that. And then, of course, the thing of uh, we, had, we had maids. And um, finding out later, because the first political thing I got involved in uh, when I came to Duke was with uh, uh, Mr. Harvey and, and the, uh, you know, the local 77. And finding out that these maids, they were making 80 cents an hour. And out of the 80 cents an hour, they were required to buy their own uniform. And, and these were people like, you know, like my mother and aunts. So, you know, in terms of images, that's what hit me when I first got here. Uh, and then, you know, later on, I had some of the individual experiences like those that have been expressed. Uh, as Kat mentioned, my strongest suit when I came to Duke was writing. I was a good writer. Uh, I found out I was a good writer in junior high school uh, when Mr. Edwards called me up to his desk one day. He had graded my paper, and an A was on it. He said, boy, you can write. All right? I mean, that's when I found out I was a good writer. And, and once I found out I was a good writer, then, of course, I paid more attention to it myself. You know? So by the time I got to Duke, I was, I was a good writer. So in, in, uh, my English, uh, freshman English teacher was, uh, and I'll say his name, Professor Jordan. And Professor, Professor Jordan was one of the... Uh, professors here at Duke, because not, not everybody at, at Duke agreed that black people were smart enough to be at Duke. And he was one of the people who, who didn't think black people belonged on the campus. And my uh, essays would come back and be all, you know, marked up and, and marked up. And uh, I began to talk to him about them. And he, uh, and that's when I learned his view. He said that, that Black, he, I mean, and he told me this. He said black students are not, black people are not smart enough to be successful at a school like Duke University. And, uh, you know, they don't warrant the kind of attention that professors should be, given, uh, should be giving them. 
And, uh, but I kept writing my essays. And uh, the next time I went up and, went up and questioned him about an uh, essay I had written, he uh, accused me of having my white roommate from Knoxville, Tennessee, of writing my essays. So, because by then he was realizing that the essays were good. So at that point, he accused me of having, uh, I'll say his name, Reed Kramer, uh, <laughs> who was a great roommate and, 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 and good friend today. Uh, he accused me of having him write my essays. And, uh, and it continued like that. And the, 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 the best I ever got out of uh, his class was, uh, I think, a C, C, maybe a C plus on my essay. So that's, that's, that's just a couple of extremes. Well, I know I'm, we're going to have to speed it up, uh, so I'm going to ask CB. Uh, let's acknowledge CB for being the first <laughs> black basketball player. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kat. You, you know, mm -hmm. I had declined to be on the panel because the basketball story has been told before. Uh, Barry Jacobs has a wonderful book about the integration of the ACC and the SEC, where he talked to all the black players and put together all of their stories and its social significance and their social significance. But, the, you know, uh, Barry Jacobs' uh, book is called, or the chapter about me is called Between the Worlds. And I really was between the worlds. Uh, my background is very similar to the backgrounds that you have heard. I was a National Achievement Scholar. I was one of two presidential scholars from Virginia in 1965. Uh, so I had a chance to go practically anywhere I wanted to based on academics, but I also played basketball. And my high school coach, Hank Allen, that, who I always credit when I'm talking, said, you know, you have an opportunity to do something that's significant. And he, in fact, drove me down to Duke for the interview. And he would come to basketball games and he would always say, do you need a little money? And he would give me something, you know. So. I came from a very strong community. Hank Allen was the vanguard of that community, but I was also a part of the black community here at Duke. So when I'm asked, why did you go into Allen Building? It was because my community was here among the black students, and I went into Allen Building with my community. There was never, you know, I wasn't worried about losing a basketball scholarship or not playing basketball anymore. I mean, the season was almost over then. We had <laughs> a, a, a few games. That's right. I did not play the next game because I missed practice that day I was in Allen Building. So I didn't play in the, uh, w I think it was the West Virginia game. Uh, I was now a senior, and over the four years, Coach Bubas and I had worked out this agreement that he would do what he had to do, and I would, have, I would do what I had to do. So. When it came to cutting my hair, I wasn't cutting my afro. When it came to shaving, I wasn't shaving, but I would sit on the bench because I didn't do that. So by 1969, we had kind of worked out this agreement. But let me just, just give you a few instances of 1965 and what it was like. I'll give you one statistic and one story. Between 65 and 69, there was only one graduate of Duke University that played basketball. That was me. I never got the chance to play with any other black player. And we recruited the top players in the country. I mean, I know that's hard to believe looking at the basketball team now, but Do Don Blackman broke all of Kareem's records at Power Memorial in, in Brooklyn, in New York. He came here, he stayed for two years and then transferred. Charlie Scott, we recruited. He went to Chapel Hill. Charlie Davis went to Wake Forest. These are players who went on to be top scorers in the ACC. But the reason they didn't come is when they came for the campus visit, there, there was something that didn't feel right to them. The, the socio-emotional environment at Duke was very difficult, for, as you have heard, for black students here. And it was better at these other schools. Now, Duke was better than some places in the South. I mean, when we went to Alabama, I mean, I can remember walking into gym and not even seeing a black janitor. I mean, it was totally white. And when the Confederate flag started to wave and 
the band chimed in. You know, I was the only one in there that, you know, all that anger was directed at. Well, I take that back. Every time I went on the court, there were four other guys on the court. And they felt that as well. Freshman year, I started every game. So you, you, you have to kind of work your way up into the system, or at least in those days you did. So you started as a freshman. Then when you made it to the varsity, you know, you played some games, but not as many. By the time you were a senior, you were playing more games. So every time I went uh, on the court with the four guys that I started off playing with, they felt that same kind of hatred, animosity. And in Death Valley and Clemson, I mean, there's a reason they called it Death Valley when you went into Clemson. I mean, it was really tough. South Carolina, Alabama, those were tough days in 1965. It had changed a lot by 66 and 67, 68. Everything was starting to open up. There were many more players in the league, basketball players I'm talking about. Uh, we were talking earlier with Gino about the football situation. The football situation at Duke actually changed more quickly than the basketball situation. But just to give you one more story to sort of drive this home, freshman year we played in Eastern North Carolina against uh, Pete Maravich and his, he had gone to, grad, uh, to prep school at Longwood. So we played at Longwood against uh, Pete Maravich and his team. Uh, on the way there, we passed one of those signs that they used to have on Highway 95, home of the Ku Klux Klan. So I go into this gym to play, and Pete was averaging about 50 points a game, and it was my jo to job to guard him then. And he had a big guy, like 6'8", you know, uh, sort of the size of Zion now, you know, <laughs> setting picks for me. And every time I'd come by, he'd stick out his elbow, and he was hitting me in the side of the head all night, and I was talking to the ref, and they weren't calling any fouls. So finally, in the second half, I got hit one time, and I turned around, and I threw a punch, and I hit the guy, and the stands cleared, the lights went out, <laughs> 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 and fortunately, our uh, uh, freshman coach, Tom Carmoody, was an ex-boxer. So Coach Carmoody was down like this in his stand, and I got behind him. <laughs> <laughs> and they took us into the locker room, <laughs> calmed everything down, got people back in the stands, and we continued the game. But that was the environment in 1965. You know, it wasn't easy, you know, playing basketball. Fortunately, Coach Allen that I mentioned earlier was the kind of coach who had prepared us for very adverse situations. You know, he used to talk a lot about courage. And when we went to Dunbar to play in Lynchburg, when we went to Addison to play in, in Virginia, in Roanoke, uh, sometimes we had to get escorted out of those gyms as well because the lights would go out and people would file out of the state. So to be honest, I had experienced some of that, you know, comp that type of competition, that type of environment when I was growing up. But that's, that's what it was like in 65. Thank you. Thank you very much, C.B. Uh, we're going to have to speed it up a little bit to, in order to cover our story. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, getting to the decision to go into the building. I'm going to let uh, Chuck uh, spend some time with that, and then I'm going to have some of you to chime in uh, if he leaves um, any relevant thing out, because we want to cover the role that Black Week played. Uh, it was the first time that we had had a Black Week on campus. We had some... Um, very inspiring speakers who came on. Uh, we're going to talk about the role that the local community played, some of our supporters. One of our supporters is sitting in the audience now. Uh, uh, he goes by Owusu, as well as Howard Fuller. So please stand, Howard. <laughs> he, he's going to be on the second panel, but we wanted to acknowledge him. And so Chuck, if you would get us um, started on how the decision was made to go into the building, the role that the Afro-American Society, the role that you played in starting the Afro-American Society, and then I'm going to bring in other members of the panel to sort of fill in the story. The, the Afro-American Society, uh, Society was uh, put together in the spring of 1967. Uh, the, the organization of the group came on the heels of uh, protests around uh, segregated uh, 
Country Club, Oak Valley. And also, uh, a lot of the energy, you know, for me was, again, I, I very much identify with, uh, with, you know, local, the efforts of Local 77 to get recognition by the university and the situation with uh, the black non-academic employees. So that was sort of, a, a, in terms of the local situation, a, a, the main impetus for it. Of course, uh, just in general, in, in general, back, I mean, I was aware of what was, what was happening on other campuses as, as far as black consciousness and, and, and forming, uh, you know, black student groups. I was very much uh, aware of and, and supportive of what was going out on at uh, San Francisco State uh, College. Uh, so I had that kind of, of consciousness. And then the other thing uh, which you alluded to, the, the real influence of uh, the Durham black community. Uh, I think today that, you know, looking back, Durham was unique uh, in the United States at that time as far as having one of the most uh, conscious and well-organized uh, black community. And I mean from, from, from the black middle <laughs> class on, on down. And uh, so as a young person being coming to a situation, you know, to, to be placed in a situation like that. So we immediately had older people who, who we could lean on, learn from, who, 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 who were interested and supportive of what we do. And you know, I'm not sure that we could say that for other communities, but, but I think looking back, we were lucky that we ended up in Durham. Uh, then we, uh, one day somebody, uh, uh, one of my white friends came to me and said, uh, Chuck, there's a person on campus. Uh, you, need to, you need to meet and see him. And uh, so I left the dorm, they went over. Uh, to this classroom, and that was this dude with a, and then he had a sort of a moderately sized afro. He wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't where we saw him be later. But uh, it was, it was uh, Howard Fuller, uh, and somebody with the, I don't know who it was, the Y or somebody had gotten you here to teach a course on poverty. And that was the first time I met and got to know uh, Howard. Uh, Howard's influence on me was, uh, was, was, was the strategic thing of doing how to do change, uh, you know, what you need to do, you know, to organize. And, and, and so that was his main impact on me. Uh, forming the uh, Afro-American Society, I'm not the only black student at Duke who, who, who was thinking about something like that. We just all got together and, and finally and we put it together. As I said, the, the, the spring of uh, 1957. Uh, you want? I, I was going to have someone comment on the role that black youth played. Um, could we get to either Mike, Janice, or McBride? If you could say a couple. Well, yeah, I'll tell a couple, couple of things. Black youth was very uh, galvanizing for us. Uh, there were, well, I, I think of uh, Adrian A. Glover and Tony Axum. Uh, primarily uh, Bill Turner, uh, the other names that I'm sure I'm leaving out, uh, but I, they were primary movers in organizing Black Week, uh, putting in the, the labor for it. I don't know the, where the idea came from. Um, somebody else may be able to help me with that, but it was a <laughs> Black Week was a was a cultural a cultural happening as well as a political happening. Uh, Amir Baraka, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, uh, Stokely wasn't here for Black Week. Dick Gregory. Dick, Dick Gregory. Gregory. That's what I was trying to, trying to remember. Uh, these uh, these were uh, important figures uh, in. Uh, the black cultural and black political uh, milieu of the time. And they had, uh, what they said when they got here was very supportive of what we were trying to do, even, even when we weren't sure what it was we were trying to do at the time. So uh, 
it, it introduced uh, the larger Duke community to us as uh, important figures, not just as uh, black students on campus, but as a, as a community. And we got to see <laughs> ourselves as a, as a community, and that uh, galvanized us uh, for what was to come uh, soon. Okay, thanks. And LeBlanc, if you would talk a little bit about the growing black consciousness, both nationally as well as locally. Okay. Um, earlier I had mentioned that when, when we got here, uh, we were Negroes. Um, and that was no small thing because the transition in that name, and I think it was, I think it was in either 68 or 69 that um, uh, James Brown came out with I'm Black and I'm Proud. Uh, stack that as one building block. Uh, additionally, um, Stokely Carmichael, I think in 67, 68, had come out with Black Power. 66. 66. All right, so it, those things started to build. And 68 was a seminal year in terms of protests around the country. Uh, the Students for a Democratic Society. Uh, we also experienced the Orangeburg Massacre in which uh, we spoke about, was spoken about earlier in terms of the kids in Orangeburg being uh, killed at the bowling alley. Um, and those things just started, those things started to build up and build up. And so the environment, and if you think about it also, 1968 and 69 probably was one of the most contentious years that the country ever experienced. In 68, you, yeah, in 68 you had Martin Luther King being assassinated, you had Bobby King, I mean Bobby Kennedy being assassinated, and you had the Democratic Convention. Uh, so unrest around the country at universities was uh, uh, at, a, at a pretty high point at that time. <laughs> All right, we're gonna, uh, so that we have an opportunity to have some questions. Uh, we're gonna uh, skip to, uh, skip a few things, but I do want to acknowledge that um, the Chronicle staff at that time was very, very helpful uh, to us, and I think Chuck will bring that out a little bit later. I do know that as we were formulating the demands, um, they had really evolved over time. Uh, from those early days when we had the study in, uh, in the president's office, to some of the other activities that took place on campus, uh, there was a growing appreciation for the measures that we, know, that we knew needed to be changed. So then the decision was actually made to go in the building. And so uh, on that day and the night before, uh, McBride, if you would talk a little bit about what the plan was. And Chuck, please feel free to jump in in terms of some of the advanced planning, especially with uh, J.R. High's assignment, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, I remember little, but I do remember meeting uh, at the house on, I think, on Markham, 1204, where, uh, where we discussed uh, going to the building that we would, uh, the final plans were, were, were laid, that we would arrive early in the morning, that we would ex exit uh, the back of a truck, that we would uh, clear the building, uh, I think there had been some uh, practice on that, although I don't know how, I don't remember how the practice was done. I remember a brief discussion on uh, whether we should take weapons, and uh, it was Chuck's position and, and mine that we should, that we should not, uh, he w Chuck was concerned that we keep the focus on the demands and we not do anything that would uh, give anyone an excuse to not address our demands. My concern was that uh, I thought we might die. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it, that was it, mine too. I, I, I thought we might die and I thought if we had guns I was certain that we would die and we would not even have sympathy on our side. So I, I was against uh, bringing guns into the building. But everybody didn't feel that way. But we didn't take guns. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
can, can, can I go back on something and talk about how we actually decided to go? Uh, just, just to dial back, um, Chuck talked earlier about the impact that Howard had on Chuck. Chuck, C.B., Becton, uh, Steph McLeod, uh, Brenda Bertie, they had an impact on a number of us. And I would say those guys had a structural and an intellectual framework around what it took to change things. Wow. And then, then you had the class of 71 and the class of 72. As Chuck would call them, it was the hotheads. <laughs> I, the, we just came in, and I, I think at the time we came in, there might have been like 20 students. There were 23 black students when we got here. When we got here. We came in like with 30, and the next, came, next class came in with like another 30 to 40. 45? All right, so all of a sudden we got this critical mass. And then you have these concentric circles uh, that, that happen. Uh, other than Bill McCadden, who played basketball on the freshman team, the crew sitting over there, we had a lot of basketball wannabes. <laughs> 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 all right, but, but we didn't see... We, we didn't, uh, again, remember, you didn't see black folks all of the time. So when we got together in the gym, we would talk about all the indignities that had happened, and we'd just catch up, and, you know, we started to form a little group. At the same time, when we first got here, we didn't eat in the same place. And eventually, I think it was the Canterbury table there, we kind of took over. And then we started to come there every day. You know, we'd see each other and we'd talk some more. And, you know, start that energy started to build up. And then a as, as the intellectuals uh, got everything together and, and you know, was talk you know they, they really had a good platform of what we should do. But we had a certain energy and, like I said, that critical mass that said, okay, we need to do something. And we had for several... Afro-Am meetings, we had discussions around what we should do. And just like the book, The Tipping Point, uh, by Mal Malcolm Gladwell, you had mavens, connectors, and salespeople. And there was a number of us that got together and said, all right, we're convincing everybody, we're going into the building. And so and this was not like a Tuesday we said we were going. This was like water boiling. It just got hotter and hotter and hotter. And we had the structure and the intellectuals, you had the critical mass, and then you had the more radical factions, and we got there. Uh, let me quickly say, uh, catch this uh, I mean, Mike is, Mike is correct as far as, in terms of when they came, we had that critical mass in terms of numbers, okay? But as someone who, as, as someone who was the organizer trying to get the thing to happen, uh, it was difficult to me, for me, to get people to make that commitment to go into the building. Um, and you know, people had different reasons. And, and as an organizer, I knew you had to respect people's uh, reason. Because the worst, as an organizer, the worst thing you can do is alienate people who then serve as fodder for the opposition in terms of creating disunity and that kind of thing. You make, you know, you alienate somebody and make them mad, then they're, they're vulnerable to, uh, to, to, to uh, you know, possibly work with the other side. Uh, so my whole thing was, you know, let people contribute what they're willing to contribute. And, and that's what we did. But the turning point for me as an organizer of the thing was when grades came out. Okay, first semester grades came out. And I had people coming to me, black students coming to me who had never participated in any kind of Afro-American society activity, um, black students who'd never spoken to me, but, but they came to me and said, Chuck, we need to do something. We need to do something. So, and Mike is correct in terms of the, the the sort of energy that the big number brought to it. But for me, as someone who's trying to get the thing to happen, the turning point was when, when Grace came out and these folks, some of them I didn't know, young, you know, they were freshmen, uh, I didn't know, they came to me with stories of what, 
you know, they had experience. And so after that, it was downhill. Uh, we had it. So I, I wanted to add that, you know, because that was important. I'd okay, like so I'd go like ahead, Jen. At couple Black Week with that. So you get to Black Week and it helps you see what the demands are and it helps us see those involved what Chuck was talking about because we had no black professors to help us. We didn't have any black literature courses, black theater. How can you not have black theater? You know, so you just went on and on. Black Week itself, the involvement in the events that we, the performances we put on, helped us to realize we really do need all of these things because there's not anything else. Okay, thank you. So we're in the building. Uh, Chuck was our designated nego negotiator with the administration. Uh, talk a little bit about that, Chuck. Well, we went into the building, uh, uh, and I'll just, the first thing, of course, we did, we secured the building. Uh, when I got in, the first thing I saw was some of the secretaries way down the hall quickly leaving the building. And I said that was good because one of the things we emphasized in our strategy meeting was, I mean, not only were we, you know, we weren't going to bring any arms into the building, we made that decision clear, but we also we weren't going to touch anybody, okay? And again, as someone said, our thing was don't give the administration an excuse not to focus on the issues we're trying to raise. Uh, so that was, for when I saw that, I saw these, Secretaries fleeing the building. Um, that was a good thing. Uh, the next thing I did once the building was secured in our in our planning and our walkthroughs, we had we had actually timed you know how you know we, we had timed it in terms of how much time we would need to secure the building. We had practiced that, and I was pleased that when we actually did it on the 13th, we uh, we beat our time. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, the next thing I did after the building was secured, I walked past the safe, and to my surprise, the safe was open. <laughs> and I was not aware that the safe would be open. And so the, my, 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 my first assignment that day, I grabbed Sundar Fleming and said, Sundar, this is your mission. You are to stay with this safe as, for as long as we're in here and don't let anybody touch it. Okay, uh, that was, uh, uh, I understand 50 years later that Sundar has a different, uh, <laughs> different story about that, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that's what I told Sundar, <laughs> Sundar Fleming, that's what I told him to do. <laughs> Dr. Fleming. Yeah, well, Dr. Uh, okay. Chuck, this is also a moment when you can share how the Chronicle helped us to get uh, press that right, day. previous to the uh, takeover, you know, once it was clear that, that, that I had the decision of the students that we were going to do it, uh, I, you know, I got with uh, Mark and the people at, at the Chronicle to, to make sure that the national press uh, were covered. Uh, I mean, we were smart enough to know then, back then, that, you know, we didn't want to be at an isolated event down here in Durham. We wanted the nation, the world, to know that it was going on. And uh, to their credit, not surprisingly, the Chronicle and all the, the folks there did an excellent job as far as that. The other person I told in advance that what we were going to do was, was Howard. I told him that we were going to go in. And I think at the time, Howard, you said that, you know, you and the black community would be there. But then I think later on you had to be because you did, you came in late in the day, right? Yeah, yeah, I know you were in there, but I'm, I'm, weren't you out of town or something? Right, but he, you know, he, he, he made it in anyway, okay? So those were the, those were people who, those were the people who knew in, in, in advance that, that, that we were going to, uh, to go in. Uh, but the very next thing after assigning Sundar his job, uh, <laughs> The, uh, the, <laughs> the, building, the building is secure. I got on the phone, called Dean Griffith, 
and said, Dean Griffith, this is Chuck Hopkins, chairman of the Afro-American Society. We've just uh, taken over the administration building. Uh, uh, we're in here now, and these are the demands. I read him these 11 demands. Uh, Bill Griffith sort of, he sort of uh, stuttered a little bit, and he finally said, okay, Chuck, I'll get back to you. And that was, that was that. Later on in the day, we had two instances where there was, it wasn't really negotiations. Uh, the first time the administrators, they came, some administrators came to the window and they read a statement to us on all the things that they'd already done for us and demanded that we leave the building. Uh, uh, the second time was one which they were, they, were, they were asking us to send representatives to another room in Allen Building and negotiate some things. And we were kind of making progress on that because they were at least talking about the issues that we had in our demands. And it, at one point during the afternoon, it looked like something would come out of that. But then uh, President Knight returned, because he was away that day also. And he returned to campus, and President Knight's position was, uh, as long as we're in the building, we're not negotiating. So that ended, so that, that, ended that. Uh, on East Campus, there was a, f a meeting going on to determine whether the faculty would give President Knight the uh, whatever authority, but it didn't turn out to be that because President Knight made a decision on his own that he would bring in the, uh, the police, the, uh, the troops as we refer to them. Uh, Dr. Samuel Cook, who was uh, Somebody, I think somebody's already said today he's a great political science professor. Uh, he called me from East Campus. He was at the meeting with the faculty, and uh, he called me, and he said, Chuck, uh, the faculty uh, is just now voting to uh, support the president's decision to bring the uh, troops and the, the police in on your arms. What do you want me to do? He asked me what did I want me to do. Uh, by now, hundreds, if not thousands, of white students who were sympathetic with our cause were, were surrounding Allen Building. Some of them locked arms. Their thing is they were going to protect us uh, from the police. Uh, and Dr. Cook wanted to know, did, he, did I want him to come and join, join them? And I told him, I said, no, Dr. Cook, you're a, you're a faculty member. Stay there and speak on our, our behalf. But I mentioned that to it goes back to what I was saying about the times. Uh, black people, again, were that issue, that black people were together on it. You couldn't find, it was hard to find a black individual then that criticized what we were trying, trying to do. But uh, I've always appreciated, in addition to his lectures on uh, Thomas Jefferson, I always appreciated uh, uh, Dr. Cook and I uh, was happy when Duke brought him in. So okay, thanks, Chuck. Let me All just right. make one quick, one quick <coughs> point. Uh, you said Dr. Cook called you. Uh, these were times when we didn't have cell phones, though. So that, <laughs> that in itself took some effort for him to find a phone that would reach in Avondale to talk to us. Okay, back to the ultimatum comes in uh, that um, they're going to send the police in to get us if we don't leave. Tell us what happened from there. We hear that, of course, and actually Howard Fuller is in the building at the time, uh, and we ultimately take a vote about whether or not we're going to stay or leave. Uh, the first vote, I believe, is uh, 13 to 12 to stay in the building. And how did it get down to just 25 people in the building at that point? Uh, once we heard that the police were coming, had assembled in Duke Garden, uh, we mentioned that to the group, and some, mostly women, but not all, obviously, decided to leave. Uh, I think Sundar would tell you that he left the, the vault and went through the window himself. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no Sun, Sundar wait, was so guarding the safe. <laughs> <laughs> no. wait, wait, At wait any rate, uh, that, that uh, left some had left the building by the time we got around to voting, that was the answer to your question. Okay. Uh, the first vote was 13 to 12 to go. Someone asked for a recount, and when they recounted, 
It was still 13 mm -hmm. to 12 to go, but I announced it as 13 to go and 12 to stay. Okay, so my, my, my recollection is a little different. Well, go ahead. Kevin. Yeah, I, I thought that the first vote was a tie. It no, the first vote was to stay. No, the it first vote, wait, the, okay. the, there, 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 there are a couple of things that happened. Early, very early on, the school gave us, I think, three ultimatums. It, wa it wasn't just one. And at the first ultimatum, a number of students decided to leave. And then uh, there was still, as the, this was maybe around one o'clock. When you got to the three o'clock time frame, uh, there was another um, group that decided to go. And then there was a group that said, we're just not leaving. And that was the last 25? That yeah, that, that yeah. was their group. And, and if you start over there, if I go with McCadden, Mount, Sundar, Vaughn, Leo, Bro, there's a group of George Phillips. There's a group that said, we're just not leaving. Uh, and then there are the folks that saying, look, guys, this stuff is starting to get, you know, probably more threatening than maybe we had anticipated. And then I think we, uh, we took a vote. It was a tie. But then we said, for, forget the times, y'all. At least forgive us. We said the women should leave. And so some of the women left with the help of, didn't y'all go through the window? Yeah. And so... That's what happened, and then we got uh, word from, I think, the Chronicle, um, the, the, the athletes that were on the walkie-talkies walkie -talkies, saying yeah. they are amassing in the Duke Gardens, and it's a whole bunch of them, and they're coming. And, okay. and, that's, and, that's and so pick the story back up back then. So on the next vote, uh, and I was counting, uh, the vote was 13 to stay, 12 to leave. Got it. Okay. But I reported that as just the opposite. He lied. <laughs> I and, and, was, and I tell was us older than them by about <laughs> five or six years. Tell us, why you, tell us why you lied, brother. To save us from dying. Yes. Precisely. I am so glad he lied. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Hey, let, me, uh, let me quickly uh, say something. Uh, I don't know whether it's on behalf of the women or an explanation of the women leaving, because uh, I think the impression is being given that the women left, okay? It was a male chauvinism thing. Yeah, yeah, y'all got to go. They got the women. Y'all got to go. Okay? We, we basically pushed them out. Uh, so it, it wasn't a thing. It except, wasn't for two. except they few. It was except for yeah. a few. There, there, were two who, there, were, there were two who stood up to our male chauvinism. All right. Oh, man. <laughs> We didn't go for and it Bertie. then, and we don't go for it now. And Bertie. <laughs> Wait, why, why are y'all clapping? She wasn't leaving me. That is exactly uh, what he would have you to uh, believe. Uh, <laughs> uh, so good. Go I ahead. I had shared with uh, Kat's group, because I'm really supposed to be on the other panel, but trying to help bring some memory. One thing they did not know that had happened was when I went out the window, and you have to look at the back of Allen Building to really understand, you're going across a moat, you know, that had no water in it. And uh, so the men helped me us go out on from the out inside, and the community actually grabbed you and helped you come on out. Uh, I was terrified because when they said y'all need to leave, you know what that was. They're saying, okay, if, if we're going to die or we're going to be hurt or we got to fight, y'all got to go. So when I went out, fortunately, and y'all know how fate is, I ran into one of the security who, back when I was there, we had a curfew. If you came on East Campus, Women's College, and on the curfew, you were past the curfew, you had to go to security to get in your dorm. And so, of course, with Black Week, that had happened several times for me. <laughs> so I had gone. A security guard that had met me and thought I was the nicest person had came to me. He said, what's going on? And I said, we're trying to get out the building. And we can't get out the building because the administration has locked us in. Those big wooden doors were locked. So even when we unbarricaded what we had done, we were still locked in the building. And he grabbed his key. I, I'm glad I don't remember his name. I would hate for him to be in trouble. 
But he opened up the door that faced Perkins. Y'all know Alan Bill enough? So we came in the door that actually <coughs> faced Chapel Drive. That, that's the door we came in. And I call that the front of Allen Building. But I know that's not necessarily what is the main entrance. But he unlocked the door that faced Perkins. And uh, I was so glad to see y'all come out. I could have just laid down and died. I was telling you, it was like, it was <laughs> wonderful. Uh, but uh, we're we're, we're going to have to... Uh, yeah, we we're are. going to have to begin to wrap up because okay. they're giving me a signal now. Oh, and so I, what I would like to say um, is that after we did decide to leave, uh, on the first vote to stay was when we prepared for the incoming of the police and we started to put butts of cigarettes in our noses. The, fil the filters? And the filters. The filters, the the filters of the... Parenting. Uh, cigarettes in our noses, and we had been told that if we squeeze lemon juice on our eyes, that it will help to deal with the tear gas. And so that was the visual of what we looked like during that time when we had taken the vote to stay. And after we took the second vote, and um, Becton so graciously saved our lives, we decided to come out of the building, and after then, uh, the, the police was coming in the door that faced Campus Drive as right. we were coming out of the uh, building facing Perkins Library. And our recollection is that they came in throwing t tear gas. And so we got out um, just in time. And uh, aftermath, uh, you all have seen the pictures of what was going on on campus uh, between the white students and the police, and that's when all the tear gas was being thrown, uh, but we were already safely out of the building, and I just want to spend a few minutes on the aftermath. Um, McBride, if you would speak to some of the things that happened immediately after coming out of the building. Well, first, uh, some, of us, some of us went in the Canterbury Hall across the street uh, and actually watched as the police uh, unleashed their tear gas uh, on the students who were surrounding the building. So the, the white students who were there are the ones who got the, the brunt of that. Some of you, uh, I understand, marched down Chapel Drive. Drive. Uh, I was not, not with that group. But uh, taunting, I, I, uh, I called my my father, and uh, to let him know I was okay. And uh, he said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to stay here and fight. He said, uh, uh, you know, you come home. Uh, and I agreed, but I knew I wasn't going home. <coughs> we had a, we announced a boycott of classes immediately afterwards. And uh, that went on for a while. The the engineering students uh, were very concerned about that, and they questioned me often about when the boycott would end. And uh, I only, I ended it when it came to my attention that it was leaking. So, so that's how the boycott ended. Okay, um, and we know that um, there were psychological, mental, and emotional um, residue uh, from what had happened. Uh, does anyone want to speak to that? I became a chain smoker. Uh, <laughs> Philip Cousin, Reverend Cousin, and Father Porter uh, said that there was a dark cloud over me. And they got somebody to counsel me. So I had to go to counseling. Uh, I think the uh, the pressure of the uh, of the boycott, I think, affected me. I felt I felt badly about that. I, I felt some responsibility for some of those uh, students not coming back because they tried to adhere to the boycott. And uh, back to the university decides to put a, uh, a small number of the students that they thought <coughs> were in the building on trial. Speak to the trial, please. 
we had a strategy meeting with uh, our defense counsel, James Ferguson from the Chambers Ferguson Law Firm, a firm I later joined, uh, to talk about why we went into Allen Building. We discussed all the indignities, and the strategy was to get everyone, all the blacks on campus, to sign a document saying that they were in the building. We did not want the university to try first 13, then 17, then 26 of us. We figured the university would not suspend all black students, although black students, had, had be, even before that, had threatened to leave. Some actually left. Some put in applications to leave. The university did not want to be all white without any black students. So part of the trial strategy uh, was to have everybody sign something, even when those who didn't go in, that they were in the building. In addition, that made it difficult for the panel of judges to assign relative culpability. To suspend some would be a disservice to others uh, because they couldn't figure out who did what. And, and, and that actually worked. And in fact, uh, that was part of the judgment uh, that was rendered uh, on March 19th. And, and let me just quickly say, uh, in, in all those different lists that came up uh, that, that they put together as far as who was in the building, and, and it was, you know, it was our decision uh, as a group to dis to to uh, come up with a list that put everybody's name out there, and you know, and again, as Beckman said, with the strategy of uh, the, you know, would Duke expel a hundred percent of its black student population, given the publicity and all of that, and, and it worked because we we basically got a tap on the back of our hand as far as punishment, but the other thing that was important to me personally was in all of those lists that they put together, Chuck Hopkins' name was not on it. And Chuck was the our fearless leader. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't take me long to realize, uh, you know, what, what the plan was for, for leaving me off. So I, my name was the last name uh, that was added. And it was added because I insisted, uh, I, remember, I remember telling Ferguson, make sure Make sure you add my name, uh, put my name on that list. But yeah, I, uh, they had a special plan for me. Um, Pat, let me point out one thing. As part of Ferguson's closing argument, he said it's not just the students on trial, the university is on trial. That was also part of the strategy because what happens with your judgment here will affect the future of Duke. Uh, this morning I heard uh, President Price and stole his note cards. I told him I wanted to say something that he said, and I have it here. This morning at a brunch he said, the occupation of the Allen Building was one of the most pivotal moments in our university's history, a moment that would not have been possible without your courage and conviction and your willingness to stand up for what was right. In the action that you took, you forever shifted our sails toward the prevailing winds of justice and equality. Marvelous statement. And on that note, um, I just want a quick sentence from anybody who wants to share um, something closing about how this experience has affected you through the years. Volunteers, anybody? I now have a glowing personality. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else with a closing statement? I, I don't know if this is a closing statement, but in terms of what Becton just read, um, the, 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 when the police were coming in at times, that was just a very dangerous situation. But the way that the university students and the black students pulled together, um, some of us would not be here if the Caucasian students had not protected us from the police. They were coming in to get us. This yeah. is like no joke. It's okay. very true. Very, very true. And at the same time, even though all the black students did not go in the building, like they said, it was really hard for them to put their name on something when we thought we were getting expelled. And to get expelled back then, especially as a guy, you're going to Vietnam. Right. And there's a couple of us that are not here as a result of that. Yeah. Uh, so. It was very critical that the whole black community came together and the student body came together. And for me, going into corporate America, it made me just more open to working coalitions and being open and understanding that there is no all evil, there is no all good, it's just people. 
Any other closing statements? Okay, if not, I would uh, like to open it up. We can. We have time to take three questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but we felt it was important to get our story out. All right, uh, here's a hand back here, and there's a mic right behind you. Thank you. So I was one of those white students outside the building. Yay. I was scared. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was a naive freshman at the time. I was scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> really, really scared and really frightened for y'all, too. I remember one thing you left out. When you left the building, you left in single file, and you were going like this. It ain't over. It Hell no. ain't over. Hell no. It, it ain't, ain't over. over. Hell no. It ain't over. Hell no. And that, that memory just will always be with me. And I thank you. Thank, right, thank you. you. Uh, there's another question. Straight back. Hi, y'all. I'm on, um, my name is Corey Pilsen. I'm on BSA. So we, uh, we came out of the Afro-American society. And my question is, what would you advise for black students on campus today? who see inequity, who see injustice, how would you advise that we go about um, fighting that? Interesting you would ask that question because we thought it was gonna come up. <laughs> and so, uh, who's gonna be brave enough to take it on? I remember I our saw discussion. I, I saw it. Uh, the, the first thing you should do is uh, you know, talk to each other, talk and listen to each other about the issue. Uh, and, and you try to best you can make everybody understand among yourselves what the issues are. Uh, the next thing you should do is um, uh, you're going to formulate your issues. The next thing you should do, you should make an a, a effort to communicate those issues to someone in the administration. In other words, uh, the, I think a good thing about what we did was we had uh, we had exhausted basically all the channels that were available to us. So I started off by saying that make sure one you and your group understand what the issues are, how they're affecting you, and then formulate the issues and, and, and you know put them out there to the appropriate administrative uh, people. Uh, we can. I we think can, it's we, we can talk more about what can happen if you don't get a. It's important to understand that we have been pressing some of these concerns for two and a half years. Yeah. I remember Chuck saying we gave them two and a half years, and they gave us one hour ultimatum. Yeah, yeah they gave us so, one hour. So, but we had peacefully protested. We was, was sitting at the president's uh, office. We marched to the president's house. We picketed the Hope Valley Country Club, and so and all of our efforts had been peaceful. But we understood that power concedes nothing without a struggle. Y'all can say it. Demand. A struggle. Yeah. And, and, demand. And, demand. and that demands without sometimes affirmative protest action that won't get you very far either. Okay. Okay, so let me go here. And, and that will be, oh, do a couple more, okay. Okay, so then Fred, and then there's a lady in the back. One part of the discussion didn't involve the fact that some of us got arrested. Not all of us escaped. We may not have gone to Vietnam, went close because of that night. And I was surprised to find out I was not the only one. <coughs> that, uh, so our, some of our lives have been impacted probably more than most people would ever realize. And in fact, Two years ago, I was a stop at the Canadian border because of that night. Thank you. We're going to take her and then Fred. I'm on the board. Hey, Catherine. Hi. Emma Battle. So, from a female point of view, as someone who stayed, how has it changed your life, Catherine? What I will say is that um, 
I was sort of bathed in the commitment to wanting to make a difference in my community. And so from that point on, every job that I took, whether it was corporate or not, involved me in some way uh, with the black community. And then after being in corporate for about 15 years, I did not have the same sense of purpose and fulfillment uh, at my jobs in corporate, with my jobs in corporate. And so I actually left corporate. And I remember a friend of mine saying to me, you know, you are a Harvard MBA. Why are you going to work for the Atlanta Public Schools? He says, you are an anachronism from the 60s. And at that time, I guess I was. This was in the 80s. And I left because of the level of commitment that really had gotten galvanized out of the experience, 1969, and at a certain point, it just would not, it would not be silenced, um, that desire to want to do something that would have a deeper impact on people of color every day. And so since then, I have worked in the nonprofit sector, I have worked in the public sector, um, and I just have a very strong sense of purpose about my life and what I do. So that's how it affected me. I, I just wanted to piggyback on that to say the untold story here is the story of the first black women that came to Duke. It was much, I know from my late wife Josie, it was much tougher for them than for us. And so as a group, that's a story that's still out there, that's still wanting to be told, I think. Well said. Thank you, CB. Uh, Fred, you get the last question. <coughs> um, I wanted to say this. I was a senior in high school in Sheffield, Massachusetts, when on the news I saw that the school that had admitted me had some black students who had took over the Allen building, and, and boy, was I proud <laughs> that, that I was coming to do. But what I have heard and what I know and wanted to see if somebody could answer it, how did you come up and who came up with the idea of black men? Because it seems like that kind of was a benchmark in getting uh, you moving toward taking over the Allen building. Black, there's no question Black Week was one of the three or four really things that, uh, you know, got us going as far as taking the building. But if you would, if you would go back and look at the, the publication Harambe that was put out during Black Week, the purpose of Black Week was not directed to us. The purpose of Black Week was directed towards the white community here. The, the purpose of Black Week was to hopefully educate uh, white people on this campus about black culture and what black people were about and what issues concern black people. Uh, it's, and it's well stated uh, in, in the publication. Uh, you know, uh, it spoke directly to the white community here. Uh, yes, it did end up having a galvanizing effect on us also. Uh, I think people have already talked about, the, the, the key thing for me was the, the, the speakers and stuff that they brought here during, during Black Week, and every last one of those adults supported us, from Dick Gregory, uh, because, the, because people in administration, when we sat in over at Dr. Dr. Knight, after Dick Gregory spoke, Dr. Knight invited Dick Gregory to his house for dinner, and he extended an invitation to Four, about four of us as leaders of the Afro-American Society. And I told the group that, look, you know, everybody's going. So all of us showed up <laughs> at the dinner. And the dinner turned into, uh, basically, it was, a, it was like, it wasn't a sit-in, but it was a, a dialogue. Dr. Knight was talking. We were raising questions and issues. Dick Gregory was putting stuff in. And, but the turning point of that thing was when Dick Gregory said, looked at Dr. Knight and said, you need to listen to these young kids. Right? They're telling you what's right. 
and, and, and again, he was one of the people that, you know, that was brought here because of Black Week. But all of them, all of those people. Especially Fannie Lou Hamer. Yeah. Especially Fannie yeah. Lou Hamer. They, they, they very is, is Tony Axum? So, so yeah, it, it had an impact. Is, is Tony? It's Tony Axum. <laughs> Tony? I don't think. Yeah, could you com can you come comment on, on Black Week? Come on. Yes, Tony, can, comment on can you as comment one on Black of the slaves to Tony. On, so I'm, comment I'm on your just break it on did down. You, did you talk to the administration about trying to get support for Black Week in the I beginning? Did. did did you not talk to the, somebody in the administration about Come trying on. to get support for Black Week? I did. Okay. Yeah. Tony was <laughs> that's, <it. laughs> that's all he wants to say. All right. He doesn't do the speech. <laughs> he did not used to be a man of few words. <laughs> Okay, so they're telling me we need to wrap up, and so I'm going to give uh, Clarence Newsom the last word. It's coming. It's 10 seconds because this is the shocker, and I just wanted to interject it. Chuck spoke of people complaining about grades at the end of the first, my first semester here at the university. Almost 50% of my class did not return the second semester and maybe a third of all of the black students who had started out the first semester didn't show up. And for me, that was a shock that I will never get over. And Clarence Newsom, who, went, uh, who was one of our strong supporters, uh, he had the walkie-talkies outside because he was a uh, athlete and uh, he was on an athletic scholarship. And in our discussion, we had said that we did not want them to risk their scholarships. Uh, but they went downtown and they bought the walkie-talkies themselves and they became our scouts. He also was, are you still on the Board of Trustees? Emeritus. Board of Trustees Emeritus of Duke University. <laughs> All right, we're gonna uh, end it here and ask uh, Professor Neal if he would come and close us out. <laughs> We're gonna take about a half an hour break for the second panel. A couple of quick things. Um, one, I'd like to acknowledge Sanders Adu, uh, who is the president of the Duke Black uh, Alumni Association. <laughs> And a second quick thing, some of you have been doing this already, but if you are active on social media, particularly Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, the hashtag that we're using is hashtag Duke ABT50. Um, so we'll see you back in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. And can I just have all of the original uh, protesters just stand one more time to face the audience? Thank you very much. <laughs>